Every time I get to this section of Proverbs, I have to be a little careful about what I'm talking about. Guys have to tread lightly when we start talking about housewives and what they mean in the family. So here's an illustration from Brett Blair that might help us a little bit when we're thinking about women as housewives. What is the monetary value of a wife's service? Let's list the various functions she performs. Chauffeur, gardener, family counselor, teacher, maintenance worker, cleaning woman, housekeeper, cook, motivational speaker, I like that one, errand runner, bookkeeper and budget manager, interior decorator, caterer, dietitian, secretary, public relations person, hostess, and nurse. When we consider this impressive list of household du duties, we can figure out a dollar value for a housewife's work in today's, and this is 2020 um, numbers, labor market. It comes to $2,226.30 a week. She makes a lot more than I do, or she would if we paid her. That's $115,767.60 a year. Now, from my perspective, Sharon has spent more of her years of our marriage as a stay-at-home mom than she has as a working mom. The value she brings to the family exceeds the value presented in Blair's illustration because she does all of those things that he talked about out of love for our family without any complaints or any grumbling. So welcome to worship this morning in the Bordado United Methodist Church, where we will not forget the value that women bring to our lives, whether they're stable moms or working moms, or maybe they're trying to do both. Announcements. You'll see our schedule on the back page of your bulletin. As United Methodists, we're just starting that season which is called Charge Conference Reporting, where I as your pastor and you as the congregation must report the status of the church to the district superintendent. If you have important information you'd like to share with me, with the church council or with the trustees, now is a good time to think about those items. We'll be filling out our reports, our charge conferences until October 27th, so we've got a little bit of time. But I would like all of you to keep um, our church council and myself in your prayers and our trustees in your prayers as we work on these extensive reports for the conference. <coughs> Jesse and I have been talking about kind of a regular schedule for choir. In my mind, it seems that we probably have enough people and talent so we could meet maybe once a month to prepare an uh, anthem for one monthly worship service. If you're interested in joining us, please let Jesse or I know so that we can include you in the email list when we start rehearsals. I would like to sing something sometime in October. So pay attention. We'll get information out to you soon. Our verse for today is Mark chapter 9, verse 35. He, that is Jesus, sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Thank you. 
Bethlehem. Happy are those who follow paths of righteousness. We take delight in the wisdom of God. Happy are those who reach out to those in need. We find delight in the love of God. Happy are those who set aside envy. We draw delight in the selflessness of God. And our next hymn is number 142 in our hymnal, If Thou Wilt Suffer, God to Guide Thee. Strike. 
make it special and smooth enough to be no stumbling block to the children, nor to the straying feet, but rugged and strong enough to turn back people's mouth. Make the door of this house the gateway to your eternal kingdom. And our next hymn is number 445, in your hymnal, Happy the Home, When God We Sleep. Reaches out her hands to 
the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. She strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surprise them, surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. Today's epistle comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 through 4, verse 3, and 7 through 8a. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure love, pure is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder and you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. <coughs> Today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
words that you put on my heart. May they be the message that these things are you. There once was a woman who accompanied her husband to a doctor's office for a check. Afterwards, the doctor took the wife aside and said, unless you do the following things, your husband will surely die. The good doctor then said, here's what you need to do. Every morning, make sure he gets a good healthy breakfast. Have him come home for lunch. Uh, let's see, let him come home for lunch each day so you can feed him a well-balanced meal. Make sure you feed him a good hot dinner every night. And don't overburden him with any household chores. Also keep the house spotless and clean so he doesn't get exposed to any unnecessary germs. Now on the way home, the husband asked his wife what the doctor had said. She replied, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is no longer interested in being her husband's servant. Maybe she's been doing all those things for years, and her husband never acknowledged her efforts to make his life better and comfortable. Or maybe she just had other priorities in the family, and her husband was now on his own. Many of us can sympathize with the woman, since being a servant, even under the very best of circumstances, is not a satisfying one. Our Old Testament lesson from Proverbs 31 describes the ideal wife in the ancient Near Eastern terms, probably sometime after the Babylonian exile. It is a highly complimentary passage about a good wife. It is very unlikely that a woman wrote it. That's because the hypothetical wife and mother it describes is such a superwoman that no single human being could possibly achieve everything she supposedly does on a regular basis. The list of attributes sounds more like a shopping list of qualities a man would look for in a wife. So it's hard to imagine any woman in her right mind who would describe the wife-mother role in such a way as to make it impossible for any other woman to live up to. The woman in Proverbs is, the woman in our Proverbs lesson, not only manages her household with enthusiasm, but she rises in the middle of the night with cheerful energy to begin to begin preparing food for and direct her household staff. She takes the clothing for her, she makes the clothing for her family and for herself, as well as extra garments that she markets and sells to local merchants. She does charity work for the poor, finds time to handle some real estate transactions, and then plants vineyards on the land that she has just acquired. Through all of this, she homeschools her children. In kindness and religion, she keeps up her spirits and behaves with such decorum that she is a good reflection on her husband, who instead of helping out at home, is free to take his seat among the elders at the city gate. This is kind of an ancient equivalent to spending time on the golf course. <laughs> With this critical view of Proverbs 31, we're judging it by standards that weren't considered in our time, but are specific to the verses, to the time when the verses were written. To be fair, we need to look at the context of the whole book of Proverbs where the topic, overall topic, is wisdom, which in the scriptures is often portrayed as being the 
to feel true. In earlier passages in Proverbs, there has been reference to the beautiful wife who is without good sense. In chapter 11, verse 22. And the contentious wife in verse 20, or chapter 21, verses 9 and 19. And the loose woman in 22, verse 14. In contrast to them, this woman of Proverbs 31 is wisdom personified. Though the description of the woman may seem to be a be from a masculine viewpoint, let's give Mrs. Proverbs her due for what the male observer does notice about her. He sees that her husband and children have a deep trust in her that she takes good care of her family. She's smart, strong, and dignified. And she enhances her husband's reputation. She speaks openly about her faith, and she helps those in need. And we need to remember that the male observer concludes many women have done excellently, but you surpass all them all. He's only saying that she is first among all women. And he does not measure her against men. And when viewed through the more enlightened understanding of today's time, it doesn't feel right to define a woman primarily on how well she serves others. The definition of a description of an ideal wife does, however, feel right if we're willing to apply that definition to an ideal person for all of us. Consider Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. There, Jesus discovered that his disciples were arguing amongst themselves about which of them was the greatest. He said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. In other words, what should be a hallmark for all Christians is that which we have defined, which is defined by how we serve others. Then Jesus takes a small child and says, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The words of Jesus could apply to many mothers, as well as involve fathers. Because isn't making children feel welcome part of what good parenting is all about? Being a good servant, whether raising children or serving others, is a Christian endeavor. And the servant attitude is the teaching and example given to us by Jesus. At the Last Supper, Jesus even provided a real life demonstration of servanthood when he washed his disciples' feet. There is nothing wrong and everything right about being identified as one who serves others. In the novel, Ah, But Your Land is Beautiful, set in apartheid era in South Africa, Alan Patton tells of a black church where communion services were preceded by the ritual of foot washing. For one such service on a Monday, Monday, Thursday, the pastor invited a certain judge, Judge Allen, a prominent white man to come and wash the feet of Martha Fortuny, a black woman who had cared for the judge's children. The judge accepts, and after watching washing Fortuny's feet and recalling how she had often kissed the feet of his children, he bent over and kissed her feet. 
an act that moved the other worshipers to tears. Sadly, the press learned that of what Judge Oliver had done, and in that hostile social climate, there was good news. And not surprising that soon thereafter, the judge was shunted aside for a chief judgeship he had been promised. Learning about this situation, the pastor of the black church visited the judge to apologize for putting him in that career wrecking position. Judge Oliver replied, however, that taking part in that Monday Thursday service was more important to him than the chief judgeship. Now, the church where this had taken place was named the Holy Church of Zion. But after the incident and the judge's humble acceptance of the consequences, the congregation changed the church's name to the Church of the Washing of the Feet. That is a church defined by service. And the service is indeed a holy thing. The description of Miss Proverbs, Mrs. Proverbs, may seem hopelessly unattainable and hopelessly out of step in modern times. But rather than dismiss it as being too servile, let's broaden its application. Christ calls all of us to his service. So as people of God, we know we need not only Mrs. Proverbs, but Mr. Proverbs, Grandpa Proverbs, Grandma Proverbs, Junior Proverbs, Little Miss Proverbs, Miss Proverbs, and all the rest of the Proverbs come. It's a family thing to which Christ calls us not only in our homes, but right here in our own faith community, which needs people who are willing to be servants and able to do the work of Jesus Christ right here in our area. We're called to be servants by our master. Let's not abandon our call. Amen. Would you join me then for our unison prayer, which is found printed in your bulletin? Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count the cost to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you continue with me in the end of prayer? Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers that occupy the earth. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these petitions on behalf of the needs of the church and the world. We ask, Lord, for your healing power for those who are ill or recovering from physical problems. Grant patience and courage to Hattie as she continues to be involved in rehabilitation after her fall. We ask comfort, Lord, for those who mourn the loss of family, friends, and loved ones. And we seek strength for those who seem to have lost hope as they struggle with the challenges that are on the way. We pause now for a few moments of silent prayer to bring our personal petitions directly to God's ears. Holy One, Hear our prayers and make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of this earth, 
so that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven while we serve you and Christ's church here on earth. Now these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of forever. Amen. And our last hymn this morning is in the faith we sing, number 2222, two, 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 the Sorbonne Song.
in the faith we sing, not that I should miss you, there's Jesse's picture from somewhere. Find us together. Thank you.